And now, here is part two of Steve Pipe's presentation on 2 Peter chapter 3. If we go to Mark 1 and verse 15, this is Christ's first words in the book of Mark. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God, and he's saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus just carries on the message of the way that had been prepared by John before him. And he says, look, the kingdom of God is here. The promises have been fulfilled, they've been ushered in by Jesus, and actually in Five different uh, passages, Jesus reiterates this point by going back to the promises of God and showing how it is being revealed in the here and now for those that were in his presence. He talks about the casting out of demons. He talks about the fall of Satan. He talks about the performance of miracles. He talks about the preaching of the gospel and the bestowal of the forgiveness of sins. And in each one of those examples, he says, this is the evidence that the kingdom of God has come. If we don't have time to go through all the writings of Paul today, but Paul also taught that the kingdom of God had arrived, but there were still future blessings that were still to come. So this is the problem, and I'm going to use this visible uh, imagery here uh, to help you. We're going to talk about this topic called prophetic perspective. Okay, if you, did, if you knew nothing about the Eiffel Tower, I'm pretty sure you would know that it's not about three feet tall. Okay, But with these illusions of photography using perspective to their advantage, they make it look like either these two individuals are giants or that the Eiffel Tower is only about three feet tall. So to the view here, we see a single plane. We see the two people and we see the Eiffel Tower and we think they're in the same presence of each other. Okay, Or how about the picture on your right? Okay, do you really think this little girl has a uh, 12-inch high little brother? I don't think so. Nor do I think that the little brother has a 14-foot tall big sister. Okay, it makes it look like they're in the same physical presence, but they are separated by distance. Okay, has anyone ever driven through the mountains? I'm sure you have. Okay, I remember the first time I saw the Rocky Mountains in Canada, you're driving on the plains in Canada for days. I mean days. It's flat. I seriously think you could stop holding the steering wheel and go to sleep and wake up and you would still be on the Trans-Canada Highway going straight in your lane. Okay? And then you see the mountains rise. And it just looks like one little range, one single range of mountains. And you think, okay, we're just going to get there and then boop, over the other side and then we're there. And then you get in the mountains and it's just mountains. After mountain, after mountain, after mountain. Because when you look with perspective, okay, you see the one peak all sort of together. So look at the prophet here who's talking about these events. He sees a single event, the future kingdom. But he doesn't recognize that these peaks are all piled up on each other. And these are separated by time. This is what they call prophetic perspective. Prophets often saw as coming together in a single vision events that were actually separated by thousands of years. So the prophets intermingle items related to the first coming of Christ with those items that actually relate to the second coming of Christ. So what was not clear to the Old Testament prophets, however, was made clear in the New Testament. So we don't need to be confused by this point anymore. Once Christ came, he explained it all. He was the revelation. And the apostles have unpacked this all so that we can understand this. The faith of the Old Testament believer was still eschatological throughout. Okay, They didn't understand this. They didn't know about thousands of years of separation either. But they still had a forward-looking faith that gave them the courage to run the race that was set before them. That's what the Hebrew writer says of the Old Testament. He says, look, they didn't know everything, but they still had a future hope. They had an eschatological view of the future. They relied on the promises of God, and they held on to those things, and that gave them the stamina to keep running. Okay, This is Peter's message for us today as well. 
So I, I found this a useful graphic from a professor at Calvin. His name is Anthony Hokema. So this is his depiction of from creation to the age to come. And the arrows, of course, is the timeless time, time frame of God, right? Because God is not bounded by time. But for us, we start at creation, okay? So we have the past age, which takes us up to Christ's first coming, okay? We are in this age currently. These are the last days. And the prophets also spoke of this as the end of the ages. Okay? We have the promise of Christ's second coming, which then ushers in the age to come. The last day that the prophets talk about. And the end of the age. So what we have here is we have the kingdom inaugurated at Christ's first coming. And the kingdom consummated at his second coming. Another way of looking at this is we have the blessings of the present age. Because we established we are in the kingdom of God right now. So we have the blessings of the current age. These are given to us. Uh, the, the writers uh, in the Bible talk about these blessings as being a pledge. They're basically saying, look, the blessings that you have now, that's like a down payment. That's like a promise of the future blessings that you're going to have when it all comes to fruition. Okay? Remember the principle of the Holy Spirit. Christ had to go away after his first coming. He says, I will come again. But he says, I'm going to give you a comforter. I'm going to send someone. He was talking about when Pentecost came. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. Okay? And the Holy Spirit was going to be a pledge. It was a promise that I would come back and I would bring all the future blessings that have been promised from, from times foretold. Okay? Well, this is a really interesting picture. Because I want you to think about what happens when you get married. What are you given when you're about to get married? You're given an engagement ring. Okay? What's the purpose of the engagement ring? Someone says, I am betrothed to you. And I promise that after a certain period of time, we are going to get married. Okay? Now, I've seen girls get their engagement rings. They're not like, eh, whatever. No, they, they walk around like this, okay, and they come up to you, hi, how are you? Right? Um, why are they so excited? Nothing's happened yet. Well, actually, it has. The wedding has been inaugurated. Someone has betrothed themselves to me and promised to marry me. Woohoo! Okay? And then there's a lot of preparation, and then the wedding happens, okay? And actually, if you take some of the examples from the way the, the Jewish people approached weddings, once you were betrothed to someone, you essentially had to get a divorce, even though you hadn't actually had the wedding yet. It was as good as being married, having received the ring. It still hadn't happened. The event hadn't happened yet, but you were married, okay? That's the same principle we're here. So what we have here is we have the already and the not yet. We're living in the already. We're living in the kingdom of God. We have the Holy Spirit as God's promise, his pledge. And the final consummation is going to occur. And isn't it beautiful in scripture that when Christ does come again, you know what we're going to celebrate? A wedding feast. The groom is coming back for his bride. Okay? So this is all harmonized in scripture. The first coming and the second coming. Okay, let's get back to our scoffers. Peter reminds us, For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago. So he's going back to this same chart. Okay? And he says, The heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that existed was deluged with water and perished. Okay? But the same word, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So what Peter is reminding us, he says, these scoffers who come and say, where's the promise of his coming? We've been just chugging along here for 2,000 years. Christ hasn't come back. Probably not happening. What are the scoffers really calling into question when they say that? They are questioning the truth of God's promises. They're questioning the very word of God. So Peter reminds us, 
And he says, do you realize that the word of God created the world? And then in one fell swoop, the word of God deluged the world in a flood. And then in a word, again, it's going to judge all of creation finally, but not to perish it, okay, but to restore it. It's going to be a new creation. It's a fire of purification, not a fire of destruction. It's the same purification as if you were trying to purify a metal, okay? When Christ went into the tomb, he died. He went into the tomb, he died, and when he was resurrected, he was a new resurrected form. He looked like Jesus. Maybe there was something different about him. But remember, people came and they could put their hands in his wounds. They could touch him. He ate with them. He ate fish with them. So we should not think that this final judgment of the world is going to be a destruction of everything that we know and have appreciated from God's creation. It'll be different, but it's going to be better. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be glorious. So we've been shown what creation can be like, but ultimately God's going to show us the resurrected form of creation because Christ was the first fruits. And it's the same for you and me. You may not be too happy with your body as it is now. I, I guarantee you're going to be pretty happy in the, new, in the new creation. Okay? The second thing is, what does this passage have to tell us about the patience and the timing of the Perugia? We're in the last days. The Redeemer has come. He's ushered in the kingdom of God, but promises a future coming in glory with the full blessings of the kingdom. So why hasn't this happened yet? Well, Peter tells us, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Jesus gives the the parable of the wedding invitations going out. And all of of the insiders, the people, basically said, no, we're just going to blow it off. We're not coming. And so... He says, okay, I'm inviting everybody else from every corner. Anybody you can invite, I want you to invite them to the wedding. Jesus is standing with arms open wide asking for all to come to him. So Peter is saying, don't begrudge the fact that God has been patient. He just wants more and more and more people to come to him. That's what's been going on for the last 2,000 years. This is very similar. So this word patience here, So this word is macrothumeo. It means long-suffering, to persevere. God is basically just putting up with this world to wait for more and more people to come to himself. Okay? Paul said this very same thing in Romans. He said, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God's not stalling off the return of Christ as if he's forgotten his promise. He's deliberately waiting in order to the better reveal his love, his compassion, and his forbearance towards sinners. He's creating room for repentance and conversion since he doesn't wish that any should perish. Isn't that what John 3.16 says? Okay. We should be thankful to God for this manifestation of his love, and we should be all the more diligent to bring the gospel to those who have not yet heard it. So this is where we end then. Peter says, well, now that you know all these things, what should our posture be towards the Perusia, the coming kingdom? And he says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all of these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent. He goes right back to chapter one, right? What were we supposed to be diligent in? Remember, faith, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. So he says, since you're waiting for these things to happen, be diligent to be found in him without spot and blemish and at peace and count the patience of your Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, reminding of the words that I just read a few minutes ago. 
according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. I think we would all appreciate that. Which the ignorant and the unstable will twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. But you, you therefore, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. It doesn't take hard to look around what's happening in our world and see all of the truth of God being maligned all around us. And where is it coming from? Within the church. I read some horrifying statistics about how the current generation of evangelical Christians think about sexual sin. The world has crept into, and the false teachers within our own churches are teaching these things. They're maligning the truth of God. So Peter says, look, don't don't make that mistake. Stand firm on living lives of godliness. Be diligent in these things. And then he ends, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. So even he ends here talking about his coming and his future coming. Um, If we were uh, to look into Paul's instruction on this same topic, This is directly coming out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need for me to write anything to you. The question he's responding to is exactly what we studied today. People have been writing to Paul and saying, When's Christ coming back? Tell us, tell us so we can can know it. And Paul says, I don't need to tell you anything. You have everything you need to know about how you need to live today. He says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, While people are saying there's peace and security, remember the scoffers? All things continue just as they always have. Then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. Um, Who all here have delivered babies? Okay. So when those labor pains came on, did your husbands just kind of like sit in the couch and finish their TV show? Okay. No, there's this panic that comes over you and you're like, get in the car and then you drive away and then you remember your wife's still in the house. Okay, maybe, maybe that didn't happen, but, um, but no, when the labor pains come, you know that something is going to happen. You can't stave it off, but you are not in darkness. Remember, when do thieves rob your house? They come in the nighttime, okay? But the Lord's coming is not going to come on us as a thief, okay? It says, look, you are chilled. You're not in darkness, brothers. That day is not going to surprise you like a thief. You are all children of light, children of the day. We're not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let's keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night, but since you belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Does that not sound like Peter's message from this book as well? Faith, hope, love. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live for him. Now remember, he switched the the analogies here. When he's talking about awake and sleep now, he's not talking about being awake and sober. He's talking about those who've died and those who are still alive. And he says, it doesn't matter. We all have the same hope. All those Old Testament, all your ancestors who died believing that Christ was coming, we all have the same hope as we who are alive. And therefore, what are we supposed to do? Encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. He basically tells the Thessalonians, you guys are doing a great job. You're doing all these things that you're supposed to be doing. So I don't need to write you anything. You don't need to worry about when Christ is coming. He is coming. You know that. God has given us those promises. What are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be awake. We're supposed to be sober. That means being watchful and ready for Christ's appearing. It doesn't mean that we should study the scriptures and then know the signs well enough that we can predict Christ's return. There are countless books in your Christian bookstores, okay, about trying to decipher the secret message of the Bible so you can know the exact date when Christ is coming. Paul would tell you, what a waste of time. It has to do with how you conduct yourselves living in the day. That's the message, our posture towards Christ's coming. Faith, hope, and love. This is our spiritual armor. That's what's going to protect us against the scoffers. Whether we pass in this life, um, you have the same hope today as your next generation will have after you. So really what we find ourselves in as we end, as believers, we're kind of in this tension. 
Okay? We're between the already and the not yet. The church really has to live with a sense of urgency, realizing that the end of this age as we know it might be very near. Paul and all the other prophets, or all the other apostles, lived as if Christ was coming that next day. This is how we are to live. But at the same time, we have to continue to plan and work for a future on this present earth, which could be a long time. So Peter's message to us is, so be diligent. Keep at it. The last thing we are supposed to do is sell all of our belongings and go wait on some mountaintop somewhere because some uh, so-called prophet told us Jesus is coming tomorrow. That doesn't fit with scripture. So we're in the kingdom, but we look forward to its full manifestation. We share its blessings, but we're waiting for total victory. And we thank God for having brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. But we continue to pray, thy kingdom come. Right? Isn't that what, uh, when, when the disciples ask Christ how to pray, that ends, thy kingdom come. We are supposed to be living every day anticipating Christ, I know you're coming back. I hope you're coming back soon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message of Peter today. We thank you for his urgency. Lord, we thank you for the promise of your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that we have your word preserved for us in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would Help us to uh, be diligent in these things. That we would live a life um, of godliness. That we would live a life of purity. Um, that we would not have to stumble to come to our senses, Lord. That we would not walk around blind and short-sighted, forgetting about the purification of our former sins, Lord. Lord, we ask that you remind us of these things yet again as you've done over these past two weeks. I pray all these things in your name.